On this week's Vaticano, the new president of Pope Francis' homeland of Argentina visits him in the Vatican. The Pope also makes an unannounced stop into a Roman center that's helping former drug addicts. Back in the Vatican, he pays his respects and prays at the funeral of a receptionist from the hotel he calls home. German Cardinal Gerhard Müller pays a visit to school children in Rome, and we hear from the Pope's envoy to the Arabian Peninsula. All this, plus these catacombs in Rome, are presented after their restoration. Stay tuned, you're watching Vaticano. On Monday, the 29th of February, Pope Francis met with the members of the Carabinieri, the Italian police that serves the Vatican area of Rome. You give the community an important and indispensable service and use your energies to safeguard security and public order in collaboration with other forces. Also, thanks to you, the people are being helped to respect laws and regulations in order to have a serene and harmonious living together. The Carabinieri are the military police of Italy and serve both the military and civilian populations. On Monday, February 29th, a group of Syrian refugees arrived in Italy, legally entering by airplane. 93 people, of which 41 were minors, arrived at Rome's international airport from Beirut, Lebanon. They're being settled in different parts of Italy. The so-called Humanitarian Corridor is a pilot project and a collaboration between Catholics and other Christian denominations. During the Angelus, a day before, Pope Francis recalled the dramatic situation of the refugees fleeing war and persecution. My prayer, and undoubtedly yours as well, always includes the dramatic situation of refugees who flee from wars and other inhuman situations. In particular, Greece and other countries that are on the front line are generously helping them, which requires the cooperation of all nations. A harmonized response can be effective and equally distribute the weight. For this, it's necessary to join the negotiations decisively and unreservedly. On Saturday the 27th, Pope Francis took part in the funeral of Miriam Wulu. She was a 34-year-old receptionist at the Pope's residence. She was seven months pregnant and died of complications related to her diabetes in her apartment on the outskirts of Rome. The funeral was held in the Church of St. Stephen of the Abyssians, located in the Vatican grounds. Pope Francis laid a bouquet of flowers at her coffin and prayed there in silence for 20 minutes. A month prior, Pope Francis recalled another deceased worker in his Angelus address and said, these are not just employees, but a part of the family in the house. After that, Pope Francis met Argentina's new president, Mauricio Macri. He came with his wife. President Macri assumed office in December and was previously the head of government of Buenos Aires. President Macri gave Pope Francis several gifts, including a poncho and a wooden Matara cross, the symbol of evangelization in Latin America. And continuing with his Saturday agenda, Pope Francis met with Italian entrepreneurs in the Paul VI Hall in the Vatican. In remarks, Pope Francis spoke to the more than 7,000 businessmen and women from Italy's largest manufacturing association about their slogan, work together. Fare insieme. Work together is an expression which you have chosen as guideline and orientation. It inspires your co-workers to share and to develop a sense of responsibility and regular relations. This way will bring about new strategies, new styles, new attitudes. How different would our life be if we would truly learn this day after day, working, thinking, and constructing together. On Friday the 26th, as part of his Friday visits during the Year of Mercy, Pope Francis arrived with Monsignor Rino Fisichella to the Centre San Carlo community at the Italian Centre for Solidarity near Castel Gandolfo. The centre works to provide and combat social exclusion, focusing especially on those suffering from drug addiction. Pope Francis listened to their testimonies, prayed, and had lunch with them leaving them with a memento. He signed a picture of Our Lady of Luhan. Pope Francis has received thousands of pilgrims on a sunny Wednesday in St. Peter's Square for his general audience. On the way to the front, he made a special invite to children of the crowd. 
In his reflection, he spoke about mercy and divine reprimation. Today, we reflect on the mysterious relationship between divine mercy and reprimation. God treats us as a parent who loves his children, rescues, cares for them and forgives. And someone who also educates and corrects when they are wrong, to help them become responsible, to grow in goodness and freedom. The relationship father-son is a symbol of the covenant between God and his people. The relationship is broken when man rejects God's fatherhood. Because of sin, man aims to create freedom and autonomy, is scared away by pride, is opposed to him and lives in an illusion of self-sufficiency. When the people turn away from God, grow distrustful of him and do not obey him, then they experience the affliction of the test. God wants salvation for sinful people. He feels the emptiness and bitterness of man being away from him. He wants to grant conversion and forgiveness. God speaks lovingly to the conscience of his children to repent and love him again. Salvation is always a gratuitous gift from God. But the decision involves listening and being corrected by him. The reprimation is part of the path of divine mercy. God forgives his people, always leaves the door open to hope. God never shuts the door and indicates that the way of salvation is not through sacrifices, but the practice of goodness and justice. Afterwards, he said some strong words in choosing the right path to reach justice. I think of some benefactors that come to the church with their offering. Take this for the church. But it is actually fruit of blood and of exploitation, mistreating, slavery and underpaid work. To those people I say, please take your check with you and burn it. The people of God, that is the church, does not need your dirty money. It needs hearts that are open to the mercy of God. It is necessary to approach God with clean hands and to avoid evil and instead work for the good and justice. He closed with his traditional blessing. Amen. A military convoy that transports not simply ordinary military goods but trident nuclear weapons. The superpowers developed nuclear weaponry with the idea that it would stop other superpowers from using it against them. The end result was supposed to be world peace. Can you imagine that somehow it makes sense to take the power that God, the Creator, has put into the atom to turn it to the designs of one country to destroy another, to turn it to selfish ends? that this could be a right use of, a, of, a, of God's greatest gift, creation itself. In February, here at the UN Geneva, this open-ended working group on multilateral nuclear disarmament discussed concrete effective legal measures to prohibit the use of, outlaw and completely eliminate nuclear weapons. About 70 countries attended the sessions, including many of those allied to nuclear weapon states as well as international and religious organizations. Churches from every region joined in declaring that war with atomic weapons is a sin against God. That's religious vocabulary for something that is inherently evil, a deontological threat. Pope Francis, in his speech at the UN in 2015, said that there is urgent need to work for a world free of nuclear weapons. But is the goal to achieve a nuclear weapon-free planet Realistic? 
the world has sickness, it has death, it has environmental degradation, it has weapons, it has violence, it has behavior that we regret, and that will always continue. But I think as religious communities, we have to strive for what we believe is godly. And I believe that a nuclear weapon-free world is a godly aim, and therefore it must be a realistic aim. We and all people of goodwill, uh, this is an issue for everybody. God, I don't think, elevates Christians into any higher position on this issue than anybody else. We have to draw together and to say, no, this is not us. So I think it's the religious communities that need to speak out more boldly and remind the world that we have an obligation to look after our neighbor. Uh, that's what God calls all his religious people to, is love of neighbor, or at least the, the golden rule to treat others as you would like to be treated yourself. Stay tuned after the break, Cardinal Gerhard Müller visits the German school in Rome. Welcome back, you're watching Vaticano. We're here in the German school of Rome, known locally as the Scuola Germanica Roma. The school, albeit German, is well integrated into the Eternal City. German and Italian students alike learn here from kindergarten up to high school. The German school has historic roots. The history begins about 160 years ago, and it was founded for the German community here, which was living in Rome. In the course of the years, our image has changed a little, obviously. Today, the school is the central place among the schools abroad and the diplomatic office, and is called a school of encounter. Here. The main goal is to teach children from Italy at this school and to create a more fruitful encounter between the German and the Italian culture. And also, to keep German culture present here at this place, this historic place, this important place, which is the capital of Italy. This particular day, a special guest is expected. The man in the Vatican, a German himself, in charge of protecting the Catholic faith. We are very happy to receive His Eminence Cardinal Müller at our German school. We are happy to have a discussion with the Cardinal about how it can be achieved that we can live our Christian faith more fully and show it. I'm convinced that we don't need to hide it. The Cardinal had the chance to visit the three sections of the school, much to the delight of the children and the teachers. There exist pretty good contacts to the church. Also, our students are very active in them. For example, as altar servers in Catholic parishes here, where they also went to First Communion and Confirmation. And some of them, therefore, will also know the Cardinal, since some of them he confirmed in the Church de Anima. But also now, during the papal visit in the Lutheran community of Rome, the students were present and did the readings. So the contact with the churches is very real. The cardinal was then received in the school's great hall, where he was greeted with some piano music. Then the students asked him questions in a discussion. He emphasized the importance of religious education for children. In a secularized society, there is nobody who can explain the meaning of our life to us. Nobody in politics feels responsible for that. Science, natural science that is, cannot give an answer because it is God who is the one who gives us the deepest horizon, who reveals the deepest mystery of being and he cannot be reduced to a simple reality, which is put on top of a secular world. He really discloses something that was previously hidden. It was a special day for the children at school, and not just because there was no class. World Interfaith Harmony Week was observed during the first week of February here at the UN Geneva. It's indeed a welcomed opportunity to use the words to be here in the temple of uh, knowledge and talk about how to best uh, um, work together for uh, uh, coexistence, tolerance, and uh, making the world a better place. 
The motto of the event this year, a dialogue on faith, peace building and development. Interreligious cooperation is very important in the humanitarian field and we need to increase it and work on that. And I hope that uh, the World Humanitarian Summit will also uh, discuss this. At the UN Library, two panels discuss the role of faith in peace building and social and economic development. The speakers, representing member states, faith-based organizations and UN entities, provided an insight on the Muslim and Christian perspectives in these two important areas. I think if you go to communities that are less well provided for, you'll find them much more aware of how important it is to be generous to one another and to look out for your neighbor. And I think it's something that the so-called wealthy societies, including elites in developing countries, have lost. In their interfaith statement, the United Nations underlines that all peoples of the world are bound together by their common humanity and their common planet Earth, and by love of God or good and love of one's neighbor. Before the, con the contradictory development of a growing public role of religion and a growing discrimination and persecution of people of faith, a question arises, is it intolerant religions or intolerance of religion. I have collaborated a lot and launched common campaigns with the Holy See, for example. We mutually enrich each other. We try to express and deliver a message of fraternity among all humans. It is the role of religion to encourage and fostering dialogue. According to Archbishop Tomasi, the will of most Christians, Jews, Muslims and other religions to dialogue and efforts for peace is a sign of hope, a sign of the presence of the Kingdom of God. And I believe that many who had declared uh, God dead some 40 years ago as a, as a religion made a huge mistake in the sense that they did not calculate, understand the profound sense of faith in, 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 in the lives of individuals and society. The Pope continues to call for prayer for persecuted Christians in the Middle East. In Rome, moving forward on the practical front, church officials and specialists from the Vatican, across the Middle East and the rest of the world are working together to provide assistance in their given fields. Thousands of Christians have been killed, millions have fled. Many others are still suffering violence and limitations on their lives not to mention religious freedom. The apostolic vicar of the Arab Emirates explained the unique nature of the church in his region. Ich bin ja in der speziellen Situation, dass ich zwar im Mittleren Osten lebe jetzt, aber das I'm in the particular situation that I live in the Middle East, but that my church is a young church which means that it is a church without local faithful. They are all migrants from different parts of the world, naturally Asia, the Philippines, India and so on. That also leaves its mark on the place in the experience of faith. We have faithful from great parishes from over 100 nations and the different Catholic traditions. Most of them are Latin Rite, but there are also groups from India, the Syro Malabar Oriental Rite. He also called for a purification of memory regarding past conflicts in both camps, Christians and Muslims. I mean that it's often like a marital dispute, right? The arguing parties bring up shell formers again and again. In the past you acted the same way that you are now. It seems that there's something similar in history. When you're fighting, then you bring up old conflicts and just refresh them. We have to overcome that. We must live reconciled. Though in a tough situation, the church is young and vital, something he says the West has yet to acknowledge. For European Christians who are visiting, they're simply impressed by the fact that the churches are full to the brim. 
Europeans prefer, though, to have space and not be squeezed between an Indian and a Filipino. But on the other hand, it created a new vitality in the Christianity and the Christian faith, which maybe at home they don't experience anymore. When I said that we need to step down off our pedestal, I meant that we should not see ourselves as the peak of human history, but that we need to have courage. We are all human with our individual human weaknesses. Stay with us. After the break, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. Thanks for watching. This is Vaticano. Underneath the hustle and bustle of the city of Rome, a secret world is hidden. Here in Rome's Petrus and Marcellinus catacombs, these ancient images have just been given a facelift. The restoration was a collaboration of the Papal Commission for Christian Archaeology and a foundation from Azerbaijan. This is particularly important in a moment of clash of cultures and religions. It is important to have the catacombs which unite, on the one hand, the classical world with the Christian world, and to have a Shiite nation, that is Muslim Shiite, to sustain the Catholicity and Christianity in one of its fundamental symbols, as the catacombs are. This is very important because of uh, um, work of collaboration uh, and uh, with the Islamic uh, world and the Christian world. So this is the, the real uh, big news. <laughs> the work was presented as a symbol of cultural unity of the people. It's a cultural heritage and the culture of every one of us, and so of every culture and every religion. But it is very important in, in this very moment, particularly uh, difficult <laughs> for the situation, the political situation. Rome's catacombs were built by early Christians to bury their dead and they were richly decorated. There are 38 square meters of paintings in Pietre Marcellini. We have restored more than 40, and the last step was much more advanced. We worked with lasers. The frescoes of the catacombs are very fragile. When there's 90% humidity, we've tried different things, but have realized that the laser is the most adapt instrument to maintain the color to leave the color intact. Still today, underneath the city of Rome, in over 35 miles of tunnels and endless shafts, countless treasures lay dormant. I'm Father Mark Cato here in the Vatican painting gallery in front of a beautiful painting, an altarpiece on wood, oil in tempora, painted by Saint Nicola the Liberatore, who has the nickname L'Alunno, no, the student. And he was a very good student, learned the techniques of his master, and what does he have to teach us? In the foreground, he focuses on Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, we know that Maria, who was found in the temple, or just outside, they called her because she was caught in sin. And they asked Jesus to if he could forgive her or not, put Jesus in a bind. And Jesus says, he who has sinned, cast the first stone. She who followed a life of sin was transformed by that act of mercy of Jesus. See, no one has condemned you, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more, Jesus says to her. And now she's at the foot of the cross. She's one of the faithful disciples, the one who was forgiven much and so loved very much. And she shows us the attitude we need to have at the foot of the cross where that blood that's forgiven us is being shed. She kneels in adoration, her beautiful flowing hair. You know, that beauty that once she used for evil ends is now behind her. It's a thing that no longer interests her. Only Jesus interests her now. And we have those two attitudes towards the cross of Jesus. That human suffering, John, the faithful disciple, his face 
tortured to see his best friend, his beloved savior, dying. And that other attitude of, of humble acceptance of Mary and faith, seeing the suffering of her son, prays, adores, accepts, is there in silence, stabat mater, no strong at the foot of the cross. And we have a beautiful detail there in the heavens, the angels that are catching the blood of Jesus, that don't want any of that grace of God's mercy to be lost so it can be contained and then poured out through the sacraments, through the church, through the continuous acts of love and mercy that we share with one another. So as we meditate on the mystery of the passion, as we meditate on how that passion has forgiven us our own sins, let's be merciful and loving with our neighbor. And let's spend time in front of Jesus, in front of the tabernacle, in front of his cross, and meditate on how that love, that mercy has been shed in our own lives. And then how can we share that mercy and that love with our brothers and sisters? God bless you.